Hello everyone, fellow time travellers, blithe spirits. It's always great to know that you're out there travelling with me, side by side, linked arms, linked elbows, uh, through space and time. This is a podcast where we consider history. Uh, We think about stories from history and appreciate that the wisdom therein is vital. Uh, That the acquired reservoir of experience out there is what we can draw upon to help us face the present and the future. Um, Today we'll be in Rome watching the last king of Rome shown the high road. I would kick up the backside to send him on his way. Uh, But before we get going with the episode, I want to say a big thanks to all the people who show their support for this podcast series by signing up to my patreon.com site. It's those finances that make everything else possible. If you're already contributing and making those podcasts possible, thank you. A huge thank you. If you're not a member, though, uh, but you feel the time has come to join, become part of the family, get access to all the extra content, Uh, all the advanced warning of content, then just go to patreon.com, search for me by name, part with some cash, and join us. Join us. I'd love to see you there as part of the family of history-loving free thinkers. Okay, that's the advert over. The details are available on this website, but back to the podcast. Strap yourselves in now. Strap into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop in my love letter to the world. Cue the music. had the power to grasp and to hold with clenched fists. On the banks of the mighty river Tiber, a seismic political shift takes place. Blind faith and obedience to royalty and hereditary rulers is thrown out. The population now decides for itself what must be done. Influenced and motivated by Greek thinking, A vast empire emerges that will last for five centuries and change the world beyond recognition. Endeavouring to understand history in hopes of illuminating the future, I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the world. Hi Neil, in the last episode you took us to the cradle of civilization and the legendary city of Babylon for its last hurrah. Which moment in history are you taking us to this week? Morning, Paul. Yes, last week we saw the world turn on its axis as power and influence finally shifted away from Mesopotamia. In this episode, we're travelling to modern-day Italy to witness the moment when the reviled last king of Rome was expelled from the city and the Republic was born. What we're going to get to here um, is, a, is a bit of history that I think will be, will be vague for a lot of people. Uh, you know, specialists, obviously, experts will, will, will know all about it. But for most of us who are, who are, who are enthusiasts more than anything else, this is, this is one of those ones that you maybe, you maybe heard about it, but you'd be struggling perhaps to come up with the details. The moment is the expulsion of the last king of Rome. Rome, in its very early days, had kings, and then it became the Republic, and and really what people think about as the Roman adventure begins. There's the Republic, and then then it gets to Caesar and the emperors and all the rest of it. But this is like backstory for Rome. That in that way of backstories. It's maybe like the childhood of a character that you you, you know the character, but you can't quite remember where they came from. So we'll we'll get to that. Part of the adventure of trying to think about the story of the world in a hundred moments for me is confronting myself all the time with how much I don't know. It blows my mind. With every book I read, I just realise there's a thousand other books because of that book that I wish I had time to read and I think I think about that because once once you're talking about something like Rome an idea like Rome four letter word and yet it's 
it's such a it's such a big subject <laughs> to confront and to contemplate the glory that was Rome. We've touched on ancient Greece. Now we're coming into ancient Rome, and obviously they're they are they're held up as or they're pillars in and of themselves, ancient Greece and ancient Rome that kind of hold up the modern world. We know they're down there somewhere. So I look back at classical Greece, the, the Greece of the philosophers, the, you know, the philosophers that we've all heard of, Socrates and Plato and, and Aristotle. And I think it, it is held up as a perfect past. But actually, even if you just start to scratch around the edges of it, well, I, I kind of came to the conclusion, it's a bit early for a conclusion, but I thought, well, ancient Greece, along with any dream, any memory, it's probably better reviewed than relived. Ancient Greece wasn't perfect, basically. You, you, can, you can tend to think, the way it's portrayed, you can tend to think it was some idyllic utopian past where everyone was clever and, and everything was sophisticated and it was all about the arts and theatre and poetry and, and appreciating beauty and all the rest of it. But ultimately, like all of the rest of the ancient world, ancient Greece was founded on slavery. There's no getting away from that. The great buildings, the architecture, the wonder of it all, that was all from the, the sweat and toil of, of people who were enslaved to masters and, and didn't have their own lives to live. So there's, there's that to think of. And everyone thinks about ancient Greece and Athens in particular as being the birthplace of democracy. Demos, ruled by the people, which is all well and good, but... The application of democracy has never been perfected anywhere and it certainly wasn't perfected in, in ancient Greece because women didn't count. In ancient Greece, women didn't get to vote. It was all men. And, you know, there was the rule of law. But the concept in ancient Greece was that you were guilty until proven innocent. You know, that's a complete inversion of our system where you're presumed innocent until, unless or until you're proven guilty. But in the ancient world, Greece included... The assumption was that you were guilty until you could prove otherwise. It was a world of great achievement, without a shadow of a doubt, but it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. You know, not for the majority of people that lived through that time. That said, obviously, you know, you don't want to be diminishing ancient Greece. You have to allow for the fact that although it was flawed and you know, it wasn't a perfect dream. It was a great leap forward. So there, I've started out with diminishing ancient Greece even before we've properly considered it. I, I just mean that it's, it's always important to go into these things understanding that, there's, that nothing's perfect. And ancient Greece wasn't perfect, but on that little thumb of dry land <laughs> sticking out into the Aegean Sea, something incredible was achieved. There was an understanding, a realisation, or a distillation of the, of the value of the common man, and it was very much a man, not a woman. Uh, there was a, an understanding of the value of common sense. And that there was also, incomplete but there, the idea that rather than submitting to, with blind faith, the rule and the authority of hereditary rulers, that there was something better in empowering people and understanding that every individual had something to offer. Slavery and women being second-class citizens notwithstanding. But there was still, in its fledgling form, the idea that rather than just submitting to the rule of a king, that, that people ought to take charge of their own destiny. You know, which is an important step in and, in and of itself. Something else that was undoubtedly achieved was under the auspices and under the under the, the leadership, if that's the right word, of, of people like the philosophers that we've all heard of, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, th this idea that reality, the cosmos, the world around us, could be understood by thinking about it, that you could reason your way to understanding. They didn't have the scientific method. They fell a long way short of submitting their ideas to experimentation and, and testing and, 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 and observation of the natural world. The, the Greek philosophers thought that you could answer all the questions, all the questions from inside, from within, that if you thought about things and reasoned your way 
and held conversations with your fellow clever people that you could come to an understanding of the wider universe. All of that was fledgling in ancient Greece. We tend to understand something like ancient Greece almost as if it's existing in a bubble, untouched by anything else. And it's always important to wonder and ask the questions, you know, what else was happening around, elsewhere in the world, in the ancient world and elsewhere at the same time? It's such a good uh, it's such a good question to ask and it's such a good mindset to have because the ideas like those of the Greek philosophers, they, they didn't happen in a vacuum. They, they were sparks of genius here and there, but a lot of it's also being inspired by those people's experience of the world around them. And they, in their own way, were working on older wisdom and older understanding. And so, for example, Buddha, we've touched on Buddha, the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who was, let's say, around about 600 BC. He understood that, that life was suffering and the suffering was caused by desire. We're always wanting something, something we don't have, and in many cases, something we're never going to have. And in summary, Siddhartha Gautama realised that if you could free yourself from desire, you could r relieve yourself of all suffering. And ultimately, you could die and get off the endless wheel of birth and death and rebirth. That was the understanding that you were on this cycle. And Siddhartha Gautama awoke, Buddha means awake, or the, or the one who is awake. He realised that if you could just free yourself from desire, that suffering would go away and you would reach the state called nirvana, which is hard to translate, but it's basically like, phew. It's like, phew. It's the blowing out of a candle, flame. It's, it's to go into nothingness, or, or really more like no thingness. It, it's, it, you get off of the cycle and you, and you cease to be, which was, as far as the awakened one was concerned, was the desirable state. Now, that's, that's a thinking that by the time of, you know, the, 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 the Socrates and the like was, was already old, but that's, that's there in their world. That kind of thinking is there for them to draw upon because, you know, contact had been made. You know, those ideas were around and in the air. And then you got people that began to think in different ways. And so, you know, for example, you've got Epicurus. That comes down to as in Epicurean. We've got a mixed up idea. You know, Epicurean sounds like a bon viveur, you know, someone who appreciates fine food and fine wine and, you know, that kind of luxurious lifestyle. But Epicurus actually understood and tried to spread the word that you could have a better life if you simplified everything. He believed in trusting the senses. Buddha, uh, amongst other things, Buddha said that our experience of, of reality was an illusion because you couldn't, you can't trust your senses. He said, you know, what everything we see and touch and, and, and think and feel, it's an illusion because our, our, our senses are trick us. It's, it's, all, it's all illusory. Epicurus said that actually you could trust your senses, but you could keep everything simple. And he advocated a simple life of very simple food, drinking water, eating bread, simple foods, wild foods gathered, the company of like-minded people, lots of conversation. He believed that by simplifying your life in that way, that that was the solution. That was the way to escape the suffering that is the inevitable experience of life. The way to happiness was to trust your senses and to live a simple life and have lots of good conversations and, and together arrive at an understanding of reality. You had somebody else around the same time who was Zeno, Z-E-N-O. He taught and tried to explain to his students um, that the way to a peaceful understanding of your life was to trust the fundamental logic of the universe itself. That there was, a, there, was a, there was an underlying order to the universe, logos, reason, uh, and that if you could appreciate that, if you could tap into that, you would get a relaxed understanding of what was going on 
in the world around you. Now that that thinking has echoes of the teaching of Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching that we've already thought about in this story of the world in a hundred moments. That there's a way, there's a flowing stream, there's a, there's a river of, of reality and that if you just go with the flow that there's a there's a solution to all the suffering. There's a there's, there's, there's an easier way to be. So you've got you know Ep- Epicurus says uh, trust your senses. Then you've got some Zeno who's there at the same time, and he says there's a logic. There's an under there's a there's a fundamental order to the universe. He taught in the Stoa, which were the covered archways around the marketplace in Athens, and as a as a result of that, his teaching Zeno's teaching became known as Stoicism. That's where the Stoics come from, because they gathered together in these covered archways, and that's where he did all of his preaching. So in Greece, imperfect or not, there are people who, perhaps for the first time, are finding different ways to understand reality. And answers to the question of, how should we live? What does it mean to be alive? And how should we live while we're here? These are fundamental questions. And in ancient Greece, some individuals were trying to find some answers to those fundamental questions. A lot of what we think about in terms of classical Greece comes from our understanding of Athens. Athens was just one of hundreds of city-states on that patch of territory that we understand as Greece. It was just one, but for reasons that aren't aren't properly understood, we seem to have more records and to know more about Athens than we know about many, many others of the Greek city-states. And so when you're thinking about ancient Greece, inadvertently, you're actually probably thinking about what we know about ancient Athens. But what we understand of ancient Athens is definitely a great step forward it's a great step towards civilization, And that much is, is a moment in itself in the story of the world, you know, that, that, that so much was achieved. I mean, it's so small. I mean, you're talking about a contribution made to history by, you know, by, by hundreds of people or a few thousand people at most. You know, the, the, the impact that ancient Greece has had on a global population of billions is incredible when you think about what, what a small plot of land it actually was and how few people how few creatives and thinkers were actually thinking about. And, but the fact is that what was achieved in that part of the world, in Athens certainly, we know less about it, but elsewhere in ancient Greece, mankind chose to remember it. Even after it was gone, and, and as it was diminishing in its significance, because the, 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 that achievement of civilization, you know, the, the idea of the sovereignty and significance of the individual, trying to understand the world through reason, not just worshipping a pantheon of gods, not just submitting to the rule of hereditary kings, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, consistent. It waxed and waned, you know, at high points and low points, and, and it was always, it was always under threat from the, the kind of underlying chaos that's always there. The chaos of the world is like a tar pit; it's very hard to avoid. It's it's always there to entrap us. It's there now, and and it was it was always there for the ancient world to trip into as well. You know, these flowerings of reason and answering questions and respecting the sovereignty of the individual human being. They were like brief moments that were always being overwhelmed again and dropping away. And in the aftermath of Greece, you've got, for example, Philip of Macedon. Macedon was a neighbouring territory. And Philip of Macedon was impressed by what Greece was or what Greece had been. And he insisted that his kingdom was also Greek in nature. He wanted to imagine that his world was as elevated as the world of ancient Greece. Philip of Macedon was the father of Alexander the Great. Alexander, in his young days, was a student of Aristotle. Aristotle, the philosopher, taught Alexander the Great as a young man. And Alexander became imbued with that idea of what Greece had meant and what Greece was capable of. And Greece became just part of his empire. You obviously, you know, Alexander conquered the known world as far as he was concerned. He died in 323 BC at the age of 33.
but he had already by that point been into India, been into Afghanistan, you know, he'd conquered this territory. And he left behind, I suppose, the Hellenic world. And in, you know, in the aftermath of Alexander, his successors were not strong enough as individuals. There was no one individual who could hold his empire together. And so it fragmented. And so, for example, Ptolemy was one of his generals and he inherited Egypt and he was the first of the, the Ptolemaic pharaohs of whom Cleopatra was the last. But there was a, a line of descent coming down from one of Alexander's generals. And then there were others who took on and inherited and laid claim to different parts of the old Alexandrian empire. A lot of what we know about ancient Greece has been gifted to us, handed down to us by the Islamic world. Islamic scholars came across the recorded writings about ancient Greece and the, and the contribution that had been made by the philosophers uh, and they, they translated it into their own language, into Arabic and they kept it safe, you know, they kept the coals burning so that rather than Greek civilization and Greek philosophy and Greek understanding of maths and, and geometry and all the rest of it m might otherwise have disappeared but it was, it was cradled in the early centuries of the Islamic world in a condition that it, it was then able to be passed on. You know, by the time you get to the Renaissance, the fact that Greek thinking and the appreciation of the world that was Greece was even possible, that was the contribution of the Islamic world because they had recognised the value of that thinking and that understanding for what it was. And they kept it in their own language and then it was able to be passed on into Europe and into our world. You know, it comes to us across a bridge provided by that early part of the Islamic world. What Greece had been, what, the, what ancient Athens and the philosophers had contributed, it was a memory that people had the wit, people from different cultures, different territories, who had come into contact with it or who had inherited something from it, had the wit to preserve it so that it, it was modified and changed, but it, it survived and could be passed on. And here's where we get to the, here's where we get to the kings of Rome. Another of the neighbouring territories that became aware of the effect of Greece was the Etruscan civilization. The Etruscans were in a kind of a central part of the peninsula that we understand as Italy. No one knows definitely where the Etruscans came from, but they, they came out of the north and, and down into the Italian, well, the, the peninsula that is Italy, it wasn't called Italy at that point, they come down and they're, they're settled in, in the central point around the Tiber River and they have an enslaved population that do a lot of their heavy lifting. Wherever the Etruscans came from, that part of the peninsula that they settled had been home to uh, a group understanding themselves as Latins. The Latins took their name from Latinus, who is a figure who's mentioned in the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey. But they were enslaved, they were dominated by the Etruscans. At some point, those dominated Latins, that enslaved and dominated indigenous population, were able to throw off the yoke of the Etruscans. Okay, so after a, a period of time of being dominated by those incomers, they, they found from within themselves the power to throw off the Etruscan yoke. So now you have a population, a Latin civilization, on the banks of the Tiber River. They revered, in their own right, the wolf, and they had an origin myth, a creation myth that they told themselves and each other that they were descended from Romulus and Remus, twins who were suckled by a she-wolf after their natural parents abandoned them. Rome takes its name from Romulus. Romulus founded, as far as the creation myth goes, this original city of the Latins. And he set in place the structures, if you like, that, that become foundational to Roman civilization. Amongst other things, it was Romulus that put in place the Senate, which was the group of individuals that was empowered after him to come up with his successor, and all of the successors thereafter would come from the Senate. 
So now we come by circuitous path to the moment, this being the story of the world in a hundred moments. At the moment in question, Rome, the city of Rome, is ruled by a king. At the particular moment in question, the king is Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. As things turn out, he is the last of seven kings. There has been some kind of decay in the quality of those kings. And by the time of the last of them, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, he seems to be a, a, a despotic figure given to indulging his every whim. He's corrupt. And the moment within the moment is that news is breaking that his son Sextus has raped a woman called Lucretia. Lucretia is part of a powerful family, an aristocratic family within Rome. Not the king, but connected to a powerful family. She's a powerful man's wife and she's a powerful family's daughter. Sextus, son of Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, has raped her. And finally, a group forms and says, that's it, that's the last straw. They're led by a figure called Brutus. The king is confronted by this group and they say, you are out, you're out of here. We've had it with all of you. And so the king and all of his retinue, all of his family are exiled from Rome once and for all. It's the last of the kings. So a civilization that had grown around and been based around a kingship has cast out the last of those rulers. And what is established in its place is res publica. Res publica is public business, the business of the people. That comes down to us as republic. That's the foundation of the Republic of Rome. Now let, let's think about this in the context of, of a place that has had contact with and has a memory of ancient Greece and Athens and the idea that rather than submit to hereditary rulers that there are other ways to run a civilization, to put faith in the demos, the people, to have the people collectively make their own decisions for themselves. It's the very foundation of government of the people, by the people, for the people. Subsequently enshrined in the American Declaration of Independence. It comes out of ancient Athens. It's a memory that suffuses the territory. Even after the bright light of ancient Greece and ancient Athens has in itself waned and been overtaken by events, people in the wider territory remember it and revere it. And it takes shape in the Republic that replaces the kingship of Rome. It's people taking responsibility for their own destinies. Now that's surely a moment, you know, the Republic of Rome, the birth, the, the, the striking of the flint on steel that makes that spark that becomes the notion of the Republic is undoubtedly a moment in the story of the world. The civilization that is engendered, that comes into being at that point, on a city, on the banks of the Tiber River, will last for five centuries, and it will change the face of the world. The perfect memory of Greece is like expensive perfume that lingers. You know, you walk into a room, it's empty, there's no one there anymore, but, the, but uh, if someone has been in that room wearing expensive perfume, even after they're gone, that scent remains behind and it, it adheres, you know, it, it, it has qualities about it that mean it clings to fabric, you know, it'll cling to the, to the curtains and the, and the soft furnishings of the room. That's ancient Greece. Rome was something quite other, where Greece just lingered and, 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 and clung delicately to everything that it had touched and remains as something half-remembered. What it inspired in that city, on the banks of the Tiber, was something quite different. What came out of Rome had the power to grasp and to hold with clenched fists.
a great mixing of peoples and civilizations stirred into the Persian pot, an empire that dwarfed any that had gone before. In its sights were the Hellenistic city-states, sat like frogs around the rim of a pond. Facing a vast army stood Leonidas and the legendary 300. Next time in my love letter to the world. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment vodcasts every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. My YouTube channel is simply called The Neil Oliver Channel. And to help build this podcast, please tell your friends about it, get them listening, and write a review to convince the online crowd to join us. For further reading about these moments in time, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the World in 100 Moments, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. The music's composed by Milo McKinn. Social media and YouTube producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. Thank you for listening. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.